Romans chapter 10. We've been working through different things about discipleship. Um, soon we'll, we'll kind of transition more from discipleship and practical things of discipleship into more catechism type things. Um, but we're going through discipleship and we've gone through just the call for us to be um, in the Word as Christians, reading the Bible and, and how to study the Bible, things I hope are practical for you. We've talked about things of, of prayer. Uh, we pray, hopefully. Uh, I think Christians are... We don't have anything in Scripture that tells us to pray daily, but that, I think that should be something that Christians do. That should be an implication for us to read our Bibles and pray daily. Um, scriptures do say pray without ceasing, so I think that should be a, a common thing for believers. Um, today we're looking at the call from Scripture to listen. And when we think about discipleship, we probably don't really think too much of just the practical things of listening. But there is a connection in Scripture between the Word. Um, so Jesus actually says, or it says this about Jesus in John chapter 1, that in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And so Christ is known as the what's called the divine Logos. He is the Word, uh, the Word incarnate. And so when we think about even in the beginning, uh, when God created the heavens and the earth out of the power of his own voice, we have that connection back to John, uh, John 1, where Jesus is that word. Um, and so there's incredible power in the word. We know this. This is why we talk about reading the Bible. We talk about the sufficiency and the inspiration of scripture. Um, we're called to read it. We're called to also listen. And I think all these things are connected for a reason. Now, when we say listen... Um, I want to give one qualifier. We know that people, even after reading Romans 10, we know that people can be saved not merely by hearing. It might be literally through reading the scriptures. Or if they're deaf, through some other means, right? Like sign, uh, sign language or something like that. But we do know that there's a practical application for us as believers, certainly, and really the world, to be hearers of the word. This is what Romans chapter 10 says, a verse that hopefully we all know well. It says, so faith comes from hearing and hearing by the word of Christ. Let's go to the Lord in prayer before we go any further. Father, please bless the hearing and the listening of your word. Please bless the reading of your word this morning. God, we, we need your, your guidance. We need you even as we listen because we know that Jesus said that there will be many who who hear but don't really know what it means, know what the scriptures mean or know what the truth is. There will be many who hear but don't really listen. Um, so help us be people who hear the word, that listen to the word, that this word is implanted deeply in, in our souls and that, of course, it pours over into application and, and it pours over into action. It pours over into a life of obeying the word. And so I ask that you would help us in this discipline, Lord, of being good listeners. Um, help us as we, as we listen this morning, not just to the preaching and the teaching of the Word, uh, but the time that we have together in the preaching and the teaching of the Word, uh, in the time that we have in prayer, in the time that we have in singing your truths. God, please help these words bear weight upon our hearts, that we are not merely letting them go in one ear and out the other but that you would work in us as we listen. In the name of Christ Jesus, amen. So again, there is, this, there is this connection between the word being given, the scriptures themselves, <clears throat> the reading of that word. If you notice, we've talked a lot about um, the powers of scripture and how the Holy Spirit works through the word. And there's implications and even direct commands in scripture not just to preach the word, but to actually just simply be reading the word. Paul tells Timothy to, while he is away, as he anticipates his coming, he says, be making sure that the people are listening to the word, that you're reading the word in public. In other words, you're giving yourselves, he says, actually, to the public reading of scripture. That the scripture is just being read for people. And I think this actually has two different implications. That we have implications to, of course, preach and teach the word, but also an implication just to hear the word being read aloud. That's why we do things like responsive reading, because we're just reading the word. 
We're just letting our ears hear the word. And there is power in that. There is, and there is a command in Scripture to do so. But that, of course, implies that we are people who are disciplined in our listening to the Word. We're not just hoping that the Word just somehow makes it to our hearts. It's not like a, 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 a even like a gardener who just sprinkles out you know, seeds somewhere and just hopes that it, that it burrows itself deep. No, there's work to be done. And we want to, we want to make sure that we are people who are not just listening in a way that's superficial, but that we are intaking the word as well. I read out of Romans chapter 10 that says that faith comes from hearing and hearing by the word of Christ. There's an implication there that we are called to be hearers of the word. Sixteen times in the New Testament, Jesus and others say something like this, He who has ears, let him hear. And we see that repeated over and over and over again. If this is an implication... Uh, of us as people that are hearing the word, and it's important that, that we have ears that hear. James chapter 1, you might say, you might say, well, hold on, we're supposed to be doers of the word. Well, yeah, but what does James 1 say? He says that we must be hearers and doers of the word, not merely hearers. But this implies that if we're going to be a doer of the word, then we first must be a hearer of the word and listening. There are many times in the church that we must be good hearers, and I want to, to broaden this. We think about listening, for instance, when we talk to our children, when we're trying to give them direct commands, we say, okay, now are you listening? Are you paying attention? And, and as a homeschool mom, many of you are doing that at home constantly. As a parent, you're constantly doing that with your children. You're right. You're trying to get down to a, a level where they can both hear you and understand what you're saying. You, you, you say things like this, like, do you understand what I'm saying? Right? So it's not just a hearing, but understanding. Um, and there are things that we demand out of our children, and they even demand out of each other, so to speak. Um, we know that there's practical application to uh, being a good listener in a conversation. So, for instance, if I'm sitting on my cell phone, this is not a cell phone, but if I'm sitting on my cell phone and you're talking and I'm just sitting here, that's, we know just in practical social norms that that's kind of disrespectful. And you don't feel like you're being heard if you're the one talking and the other person is just listening or looking at something on their phone. Um, and there's certainly application to that. But we don't want to just make a direct application only to the listening of the word being preached and taught. There are actually other applications in the church. We're called, I think, to listen to the prayers of others. We mentioned this when we went through prayer. So when we pray in a minute, I'm not called to just constantly be praying myself where I don't hear anything, but actually your prayers are edifying to me and, and vice versa. And our prayers should be edifying to one another because we are Christians and we're doing this together. We're lifting up our voices in unison. And so you want to be listening to the prayers of others. Actually, when I teach this to my children, when we pray at home, I say, now, what are you supposed to do during prayer? And one of the things I tell them to do is listen, listen, um, because we can be benefited from the prayers of others. Listen to the words that we sing. We are called to sing. Obviously, we see that in Colossians. We see that um, in a few places in Scripture. But we're called to sing. But we're called to listen to the words that we sing. We're not just called to sing and just, okay, we sing, we do that thing, and we, we like the sound of our own voices, and we move on. It's not just an obligation. It's something that benefits us as Christians. So we are called to listen to the words that we sing. We're called to listen to other Christians when we fellowship <coughs> Like, like when we have meals together, part of that is not just that we eat. Now, the eating part is good, right? We all, that's, that's good. We benefit. We want to do that. But the benefit is that we're eating with Christians. We're fellowshipping with Christians. And so while we're, getting in, while we're doing this thing, while we're getting in the, into this meal, we're also getting into each other's lives. We're hearing about things. We're, we're maybe applying things that we heard in the sermon or working through those things. Um, we're talking about different things that are going on in our lives and hopefully speaking to one another in these ways that are spiritually beneficial. Um, we do that when we dialogue, when we have times like on Wednesday nights where we work through things as a group. We want to wrestle through those things out loud. And it, it doesn't just benefit you to speak, it also benefits you to listen. And I actually think it probably benefits us more to listen than it does to speak. Uh, in fact, I think preachers have to be incredibly careful I have to be incredibly careful because I think our natural tendencies is to say, okay, well, what am I saying rather than what am I hearing? 
Because I can say a lot. Like, I know a guy who, <laughs> he's a really good talker, and he never prepares for sermons. And when he says that, it doesn't surprise me in the least. I think he can absolutely stand before people and talk for an hour without preparing whatsoever. I'm sure he can do that because he talks a lot, you know. But is he listening? Am I? Is Robert, if you ever teach these things to your children, are you listening to the word or merely just wanting to get to the part where you get to communicate? And we'll talk about that more in a minute. But we're called to listen to fellow Christians in this dialogue and fellowship. And, of course, we are called to listen to the teaching and the preaching of the word. We can hear it, and we have people in our pews, in our churches in America, and all over the world who will die and never knew Christ. People that you know in your family, maybe, that go to church. But if you're around them, it doesn't seem like they really have any connection to Christ. Because they are, they are in the church, they are in a way hearing some noises, right? They're hearing something. But there's never a connection down to their hearts. I remember when I was in college one time, I listened to a very powerful sermon that, that it didn't change my life necessarily, but the Lord certainly used that and, and other things to benefit me. And some of you have listened to this sermon. It's, a, it's Paul Washer's kind of first sermon that kind of got him famous, I guess. This uh, what, What's it called? Shocking they put on there the shocking youth message. I doubt that that's what he titled it. Knowing him, he would probably be mad that somebody titled it that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But if you've heard that sermon, it's very powerful. And when I was, you know, 19 or whatever, 18 years old, that kind of blew my mind a lot. And I remember bringing that home to somebody else in my family and saying, hey, listen to this. This is crazy. And they listened to it and were like, oh, yeah, that's nice. Okay. And I'm like, you didn't he just that. shattered everything I knew about or everything I thought I knew about the gospel. He shattered that. And you're listening to it and going, oh, okay. You've probably heard sermons where you thought, man, that's really, really solid, something you listen to at a conference or even in church or online or whatever, and you send it to somebody or you were listening with somebody else, and they had no affection toward that. They had no concern. It was just fell on deaf ears. So we are called to be listeners of the word and hearers of the word and for it to go deep in us. So I want us first to, to look at this in two different ways, one of which is to avoid certain, I guess, pitfalls of bad listening or things that you want to avoid. And then we'll talk about listening well. First, um, this is super, super, super practical. Now, this is not always perfect, right? But I think we're called, if we can be, to when we, you know Sunday's coming, right? On Monday, you know Sunday's coming, unless the Lord Jesus Christ comes back or he, he takes you, right? We, we know it's coming. So we, in a way, we plan for that. And so on Wednesday and Friday and Saturday night especially, you plan for Sunday. Now, some of you might do that through meals, being ready for the next day or thinking about what you're going to cook the next day or, or whatever it is. Uh, but we also need to be thinking about being a hearer of the word. So I think there's a practical application to not staying up till 4 a.m. watching movies and then trying to go to church on two hours of sleep, right? And then not being able to listen. That's just a practical, practical, practical thing for us. Now, sometimes that means, you know, We've had a night where our kids are up all night. And so that's not going to be perfect, right? We know that. There are times where things get in our way. Um, I know people that uh, they work nights, but they will show up to church on that Sunday morning no matter what because they want to be there. And they are dead, right? They are physically just drained. But they work nights, but they want to be there. So they're probably not hearing as much as maybe you are with, with a great night of sleep or whatever, but they're there. And I think that we do what we can there. But don't be too tired. Get sleep. Be ready for Sunday. I think our lives, in a way, should evolve around or revolve around Sundays. Um, and I don't mean in some idolatrous way of putting the church higher than it should be and worshiping the church like Catholics or something like that. Uh, but we do, I think, should have a practical application to revolving our lives. That when I take a vacation, it's not on a Sunday. When I, you know, go to the river or something. It's, it's not times when I'm missing what God has called me to do, right? And I, I think it's, it's, um, it's something that, we sh that should be practical. Uh, I think we should want to be together, want to be ready to be together. So that means physically being awake and, and ready. Um, now more spiritual applications. Do not hear only what you want to hear. It's a dangerous thing that we come to listen to something that is only what I want to hear. Second Timothy chapter four, 
And Paul is warning Timothy that there will be some people that will come and they will come to want to have their ears tickled. You've heard this verse mentioned several times in that regard. But what Paul tells Timothy in 2 Timothy 4, verse 3 is this. He said, for the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. But wanting to have their ears tickled, they will accumulate for themselves teachers in accordance to their own desires and will turn away their ears from the truth and will turn aside to myths. But you be sober in all things, endure hardships, do the work of evangelists, fulfill your ministry. I think what Paul is telling Timothy here is not that the world will want to have their ears tickled because that's, that's obviously true. I think he's saying there will be a time that will come where people in the context of the church will want to have their ears tickled. And so they will get rid of the elders that preach the gospel or they will leave that or whatever and go to people who will tell them in a religious setting what they want to hear. So I think that there will be people, and we see this in our culture, right? I don't like this preacher, I want to go to this preacher. I don't like this preacher, I want to go to this preacher. I don't like the music of this church, I want to go to this. And, and we kind of tailor-made or we tailor made, uh, make churches into um, pragmatic, um, you know, have it your way type places. And we need to be careful because we don't want to be guilty of that even if, it, if, it, even if we are people who, you know, have it continually kind of erode even in our own lives where we are listening and saying, okay, I need a, really, I need a pick-me-up today. Well, that's, that's not the purpose of the gospel, right? Or I need, to, I need to really hear something that really pre- preaches to me. I just need to hear the word. And whatever the word says, I yield to that. So don't be just a hearer of what you want to hear. Um, and that certainly can happen in the context of the local church. Uh, this is pretty easy. Do not just hear and then ignore what you hear. Or what's, what's difficult for me is not just ignoring what I hear, but also forgetting what I hear. So there's, a, there's something that we do, I think, that we could hear what, what, what is going on, but then really just ignoring it. And I honestly think that that's the worst place for a person to be, is to sit in a pew or whatever and listen, nod our head in approval, but have it never actually stir us. Have the word never actually affect us in any way. It's just something that essentially we're ignoring. That we're just saying, oh yeah, that sounds good. But it never really burrows down deep in our hearts. We just ignore it. Or that we hear the word and immediately forget the word. Because it doesn't really have any application to us or whatever the case is. We just forget it. And we really don't care about the word itself. We, we can't be there. And by the way, I think that's a battle for you every single time we meet. That is a battle for me every single time we meet. It's a battle for our children. We're trying to preach the gospel to them, right? And so much of what they hear is just going to go in one ear and out the other. But that's me too, if I'm not careful. I'll hear it. I'll think that sounds really good. And it has no impact on me. I can't do that. We also can't be guilty of listening or hearing for merely intellectual gain. So we can't hear it and say, man, that's good theology, and kind of write it down in our minds. But then it never again affect our hearts. We can't just say, well, I have good theology now. I'm listening to this good preaching, but it really doesn't affect any of my heartstrings. It never pulls me in affections. Now, sometimes our culture, we only want to have affections. We only want to have affectionate uh, pulls to everything. So we don't want to have either one only, right? We don't want to have only intellectualism preached, right? So we don't want to get done with our church and say, well, listen, we're a lot of smart folks here, a lot of brilliant people. We have a lot of PhDs. Everybody's just really smart in theology. But if it has no effect on our hearts, then it doesn't mean anything. It's just empty theology. On the other hand, it can't, the word can't only pull our heartstrings. And then every Sunday, like a church camp with a bunch of teenagers, we cry over the word, but then we leave and it has no effect. Or we cry about what we've heard, or we are stirred in our emotions, maybe even to give. We give a lot of money or whatever we do. And we're affectionately stirred, but then it really doesn't mean anything intellectually. So then we just take in anything that we hear, and anything can stir us. So I can be stirred as much by John the Baptist as I could be about, you know, Judas. 
if he was to preach or somebody else in the Galatian uh, church or something that's bringing in false teaching. I can be stirred by either one. I'm affectionate towards either one. We can't be that way either. We have to be both affectionate and hearers that benefit in a theological and intellectual way. So, how do we listen well? How do we listen well? Here's a few things to help us. Jesus says, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. We want to hear to understand the word. So when you read the Bible, you don't just read the Bible to read the Bible. You read the Bible to hopefully understand what the Bible means, what it says. When you hear, you want to understand the word. There were Pharisees that knew the word. Many people in our culture, you probably met many people in our culture, that you're like, this guy knows the Bible, but man, his theology is terrible. And isn't that such a sad thing? That they know the words of the Bible, but it doesn't actually, it doesn't actually connect to knowing Christ. So we want to hear the word. We want to understand the word. We want the, un- the word to actually affect us. We want the word to affect us. So that's how we listen. We listen to hear about the character of God. We listen to hear about sound theological connections in Scripture. We hear things that are practical in their application for us and how I live in a life, a life that's godly and for the sake of Christ. So we want to hear and understand the word. We all also want to listen with humility. Listen with humility. I think it's easy for us to listen and to think, man, my neighbor really needs this sermon. Or the person in the row behind me really needs this sermon. One of the, the most frustrating and at the same time sad things for me in my life is when I've been in a church that I know is a cold church, my home church is like this, I think. Maybe, maybe you have churches like this that you've been in. Where the preacher says something that's so generic. Maybe about some sin that everybody else agrees with. Like homosexuality. And you have half the church nodding their head and saying amen. And that, that both frustrates me and breaks my heart at the same time. Because you have people that will hear the word. That will nod their heads in approval. Yep, that sounds really good but in this prideful way, assume that it has nothing to do with them. If we're in Christ, and even for those not in Christ, we must listen to the word humbly, knowing that it's for us. You might have heard John 3.16 preached a million times. You need to listen to it with humility. You might have heard Genesis 1 taught a million times. We are called to listen to the word with humility. To listen to the word with humility. Another practical application is to listen with focus and attention. I know this sounds like a, you know, maybe a simple thing to say, but I think this is incredibly important. Because if we're not focused in attention uh, and, and attentive to the word, then we miss things, right? And, and that I'm incredibly guilty of this. How many of you have ever been in a sermon, even a lesson, maybe even in the last five minutes? Where you realize for the last five minutes you haven't heard anything that was said because you were in some other world. Okay, well, I'm that way, me and Jared apparently, and Leah. <laughs> but I'm definitely that way. Because <laughs> I, I can listen and I'm there, but I'm not there. Uh, and that's, that's just, I think, us tr- trying to train, and, and this, this is always going to happen for some of us, is to just constantly train our minds into listening. Some of that's just simple eye contact, always trying to make eye contact as much as we can. Stuff like that. Write notes down. Some of the kids write notes down. I think that's helpful for them because for whatever reason, uh, studies show that there is a, there's a connection when you write things down mm-hmm. to when you hear them and they, they for some reason connect. Now, I don't really take a lot of notes during sermons actually because for me, I find it actually more distracting for me personally. Now, that might be different from you. You might need to take notes. I think different people are different. And so whatever you can do to, to ask questions or even write notes of questions, or yeah, write questions down. Um, when we have dialogue, so when we're in fellowship, or when we, we have dialogue on Wednesday nights, be careful in the dialogue to, to also listen. There are times where Christians, I think, need to be quiet, right? Um, there's a proverb that says, essentially, you know, the fool is, is uh, you know, can remove all doubt about his foolishness if he opens his mouth. In other words, and I'm kind of butchering this proverb. I probably should have looked it up before I mentioned it. 
Uh, but basically the proverb is um, if, you, if you want to be uh, perceived as you know, wise, then don't always be speaking or people are going to know that, that you're not wise. I think there's a wisdom into, into um, us just listening and hearing. And I've had to learn that the hard way, saying stupid things and think, I said a stupid thing. And that was really dumb. And I wish I wouldn't have said it, right? Um, and I think there's this practical application to, I, I don't think being around Jesus was him just constantly yapping, you know? So I think, I think we can have a, a helpful time in listening there. And when we listen to others, not just thinking about, be thinking about rebuttals or, or something that we want to say. I'm, I'm certainly guilty of that. Listening in a, in a dialogue way and think, okay, I can't wait to get my word out there. Rather than trying to understand and hear what other people are saying. I, I'm guilty of that a lot. And lastly, and this will kind of this will kind of lead us into prayer. This is what I mentioned earlier. This is in James chapter one. I want to read this section to you as we as we look to pray together. And, and I want us to be praying for these things that we are people who are listening to the word, that the Spirit is using and working through the word to to change us, to make us more like Christ, um, to humble us. This is what James says, and he's of course preaching that that we can't merely be hears but that the word if it's really stirring if it's really going into our hearts then we're going to obey the word he says this in verse 22 of James 1 James says but prove yourselves doers of the word and not merely hearers who delude themselves for if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer he is like a man who looks at his natural face in the mirror for once he has looked at himself and gone away he has immediately forgotten what kind of person he was. But one who looks intently at the perfect law, the law of liberty, and abides by it, not having become a forgetful hearer, but an effectual doer, this man will be blessed in what he does. We are called to be a people who are hearing the word, hearing it well, and then obeying the word, yielding to the scripture, that the word itself would mold us and to shape us and part of that is the discipline of us listening and being better at that. So as we, as we go to the Lord in prayer right now, I want to ask Tommy if you wouldn't mind starting us off. And then um, I'll close us. And if you want to pray, pray. But be praying for us to be better hearers. That we will be the people who are disciplined to hear the words. And not just, not just the spoken word, but that the spoken word would preach to our souls. That the word of God would change us and make us more and more like Christ. And we pray for our children and that those who don't know Christ would hear the word. They wouldn't just hear it as intellectual information, but that it would change their hearts, that Christ would work through these words, that the Spirit would work through these words to change them. Tommy, would you lead us in prayer?